so exciting. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this uh, live uh, online event, sorry, not live, online event of making connections that last. My name is Janine Miaton and I'm the events marketing manager here at Meetup. Uh, again, welcome to Meetup Live. Um, today we are joined by a special guest, Susan McPherson, and she is the author of The Lost Art of Connecting. She's joining us for a discussion on how to build meaningful connections. Uh, Susan's going to share strategies for networking in your professional and personal life um, and how to effectively gather people together and become a better listener. Um, I think all things that I need help with. So before we start the conversation, my goodness, if I can get my mouse to work. Sorry, y'all, I'm having technical difficulties. Okay. Before we get started uh, with the conversation, I'm going to go over our event guidelines. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this event is being recorded, but do not worry, you will not appear on video. Uh, only Susan and myself are on video. Um, with that said, if you have to drop off at any moment, we have you covered. You can access a recording and a recap of this event on our blog at meetup.com slash blog. Um, also, everyone is muted. It's a courtesy. You will only be able to hear Susan and myself and my wonderful tunes. Uh, questions. If you have questions, please, please, please submit your questions in the Q&A feature. We encourage you to. Uh, we want to hear from you and Susan will be answering your questions at the end of the event. Okay, sorry. I'm getting... And now my dog is looking up. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Um, welcome to working from home. I forgot to mention that I have a very loud uh, little uh, Otis. Um, I apologize for that. Um, so again, as I was saying, we encourage you to submit your questions. The Q and A feature is at the bottom of the screen. Um, closed captioning is available thanks to Zoom for this great feature. You can turn it on by clicking on the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen, and you can select your preference. Uh, so really quickly, the agenda, uh, introductions, which we're going over the event right now, and I'm going to shortly introduce Susan, followed by 40 minutes of a conversation with Susan, and then Q&A for 15 minutes where I will be asking Susan the questions that y'all submit in the Q&A. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Hi, Susan. Um, so just a quick introduction on Susan. Um, Susan is a serial connector, angel investor, and corporate responsibility expert. She is the founder and CEO of McPherson Strategies, a communications consultancy focused on the intersection of brands and social impact. She is also the author of The Lost Art of Connecting, the Gather, Ask, Do Method for Building Meaningful Relationships. Susan, thank you so, so much for being here today. We are so happy to have you. I'm really excited to be here and I can't even tell you, I, I normally don't get nervous for these, but with the fact that you, there is such a global audience, it's a little scary. <laughs> oh, don't be scared. No, this is really great. I mean, it, clearly it just goes to show like people want to hear from you, right? And that's, I'm so glad that they tuned in because you have so much to say um, and just really great information. Uh, okay. I'm trying to make sure that Otis is quiet and it seems that he is. So uh, let's go ahead and, you know, dive right into the conversation. Um, Susan, my first question for you is, uh, you just wrote your book, your first book, The Lost Art of Connecting. Why did you decide to write the book and why now? Sure. Well, interestingly enough, when people see the title, they assume the book was written in reaction to the pandemic. Um, because we have been so isolated. But the actual idea and the book proposal and all the things that go into writing a book or getting the approval to write a book happened five years ago. And it basically was a result of my fear that we had lost that humane side of connecting with one another, the, the love, the compassion, the intentionality that we had put. And we had become in some ways slaves to the technology that makes it easier to connect, but it also makes it easier to connect without any kind of intention. And lastly, a friend of mine mentioned, and this is almost what put me over the edge, that when she would take her uh, son and daughter to the school bus stop and she would hug them goodbye and send them up onto the, onto the big yellow school bus, when they took their respective seats, 
she would see both of their heads plop down to look at their handheld devices, age 10 and 12. And every other child on the school bus did the exact same thing. And it dawned on me that this, isn't, this is not good for our future, right? Um, and so that is kind of what precipitated. And lastly, I founded my company at age 48 and I'm now 56. During the eight years of the company's history, about 95% of our business has been inbound. We just hired our 13th employee. Congratulations. Um, very, very proud of all that. But the fact that all that business was inbound told me or taught me that the connections, the intros, the generosity that I put into connecting others has come back to help. And it wasn't like in my 20s or 30s and even my 40s, I was sitting there thinking, in another 20 years, I'm going to be running a company, so I'm going to come calling. So in other words, I, I wanted to share, you know, that, 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 that there is a raison d'etre, meaning we, you know, there's a reason to be building and putting emphasis on making meaningful connections besides the fact that it's just fun. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I feel like it was almost kind of prophetic, right? Like you saw what was going on and then it was just like, okay, if, we don't like, this is kind of like the antidote, right? Like if we don't do this, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is the antidote to that. Um, so you write about uh, that you grew up thinking that connecting with people regularly was a natural occurrence in many ways because your parents were natural connectors. Yeah. Um, how did this idea become so central to who you are? <laughs> well, in the little little town in upstate New York, north of Albany, for, for those of you from far away, um, every morning at the breakfast table in the late 60s, early 70s, I would vie for real estate for my bowl of cereal or, or toast with jam because there would be the five local newspapers plus yesterday's or the day before's New York Times and Boston Globe that my parents would be madly clipping and cutting for anything that sparked the thought of someone else they knew. And then they would go to their respective manual typewriters, type short little missives saying, thinking of you, uh, this, this made me, you know, this, this reminded me of something you had said or done. And off into the US postal mail, they would go. And I just assumed everybody's parents did that. And then come the late 80s, when I got my first fax machine, all of a sudden I could do this instantaneously. Although I just, I have to admit, I have a feeling those faxes are still out there floating because I could never figure out really how to use a fax machine. And then lastly, in the mid 90s, when the internet happened and we had, you know, dial up CompuServe and AOL, all of a sudden I could take 15 people that lived in New Zealand or Israel or wherever and connect them on one email chain with some point of commonality. So I like to say the commonalities and the uncommonalities and bridge connections. And in some way, that's what Meetup does, right? I mean, this is what you're, you know, the whole ethos of this organization. That is exactly uh, what we do. But it was very much using technology to do the things my parents did, obviously very, you know, with, with, with rudimentary technology, if you call a manual typewriter, even technology at this point. <laughs> um, so was that, I, I have a question. So was this like when you had your aha moment that it's like, okay, my, like, you know, I'm going to be a facilitator of connections or was it, when uh, you saw, you know, your friend's kid on the, when you heard the story about the kid on the school bus. I know that was like the precipice for your book, but was that like when you had this moment that it was like, okay, I, this is what I want to do. Like, you know, my parents had it right. How do I bring this back? Well, I, you know, I am the first person to wake up every morning with imposter syndrome, um, you know, and, and I continue even after writing a book and running a company. So good Lord knows why, but that's just the, the case. But I actually can pinpoint the date that I actually um, formally was able to accept that I am a serial connector and put it out into the world. And it actually happened at a, at a retreat in 2007. Um, I knew I had you know, spent at that point almost 40 years um, connecting people. And I was kind of like, how can I go ahead and offer um, details to, you know, and, and tips and tricks to people that I know and care about or people that I don't. And in 2007, eight very dear friends went away to a, um, for an offsite in the Catskills, which is about two hours north of New York also. And that goal of that weekend was to come up with our superpowers and be able to articulate them, our elevator speeches. And it was 
literally that Sunday afternoon sitting in the safety of seven or eight dear friends that I was able to finally say, hi, I'm Susan McPherson and I'm a serial connector, da, 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 da. I'll be honest with you, when I said it, I almost peed in my pants. <laughs> that is so ridiculous. I mean, who calls them? You know, it, it just, but then three years later, I was called out to speak on a stage and they said, well, we introduced Susan McPherson, a serial connector. And I'm like, oh, and again, almost peed in my pants. But today, 17, or I can't do the math, but years later, I wrote a book on it. So I think the message to everybody participating today is, you know, it's really important to figure out what our superpowers are. And for lack of better terms, like own them, share them with the world and, you know, bounce ideas off those that are closest to you, the people that you love, your significant other, your neighbors, your, your, your puppy dog. Um, but that is the best way to kind of feel it out and test it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, I'm so glad you said that. I I, I feel like that's pro- for me specifically. That's probably the hardest thing is like saying it out loud repeatedly yes. and practicing it, right? Yes. And there's so much power in that. Yes. Um, yes. Um, okay, so uh, you created the method uh, gather, ask, and do. Um, can you explain what it is and how it works, please? Sure, sure. Well, the book is divided into three sections: gather, ask, do. And the gather phase is um, essentially a very much of a self-reflection where the first and foremost thing you do, and, and I would even go and ask everybody in the chat, but we can, we can table that, but think internally, what is a meaningful connection to you? Because for everybody, it's very, very different, okay? Secondly, what are your goals over the next four years, four months, hell, four weeks? And who is it that you want to connect with or reconnect with that are going to help you meet those goals, but also, and very importantly, that you can help reach their goals, okay? And I'll explain that point in a, in a little bit. Also in the gather phase, you do what I did back in 2007. What are your superpowers? What are your secret sauces? How can you support others? And, you know, oftentimes people very, you know, just out of college will say, Susan, I don't have any Every single one of us has superpowers and throughout our lives, they will ebb and flow, whether it's, you know, cooking an awesome tomato sauce to speaking three foreign languages or even one foreign language, we all have superpowers. And lastly, during the gather phase, to think very intentionally about how we're gonna break that hermetically sealed bubble that keeps us meeting people that look like us, sound like us, the same age as us, the same racial uh, race as us, the same cultural heritage as us. Because we all know a fish can't see water unless it breaks out of its bowl. So that's the gather phase. The ask phase is learning to ask the meaningful questions of others so that you can learn what their hopes and dreams are. The underlying theme of the entire book, Under Gather As Do, is leading with how can I be helpful to others. Now, that doesn't mean not taking the oxygen mask first, but it means the more help you lead with, the more help that will come your way. So in the ask phase, it's very much about, you know, how do you learn what Janine's and Ariana's and Emily's and everybody in the audience, what, what are their hopes and dreams? And lastly, if you listen carefully, which... I learned that we are all woefully bad at, um, obviously that's a generalization, including myself. But if you, if you listen carefully to others, you then can get to the do phase, which is my favorite phase. And that's where you take everything you just listened to and you're able to be responsible, reliable, follow through, trustworthy, all the things that we want to be both personally and professionally. And obviously the book goes into way more detail, but that's the gather ask do phase. Thank you. Um, I, I guess like for me, probably the most intimidating part would be like, you know, uh, when you reach out to someone, right? Or there's someone that you want to talk to and you're trying to figure out who is, you know, which person will be right for the goal and then yeah. finding like h- figuring out how you can help them. Like, I feel like that's something that I would get stuck with, right? Like if I'm reaching out to a VP or a CEO, like how do I know, you know, what's the way, like how do I figure out what I can offer them, how yeah. I can help them. Like, that's very intimidating. Well, I would first do that, what, what my superpowers are first, before you even start. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you were to map this, that, that gather phase is really thinking about what is it that I can offer. 
And don't shortchange yourself, because again, we all have superpowers. Two, I think it's really important to realize that we have all the tools in our toolbox to figure out, for the most part, what ways we can be helpful. Because in my day, in the, in when I was starting professionally, and oh my God, I sound like a grandmother here, but in the 80s, the only way I could find out about somebody before I reached out to them, and I usually had to go through a gatekeeper, was via the Yellow Pages and the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now you have every tool. You can, you know, you can find out their career trajectory. You can find out if they they volunteer. You can find out, you know, what they're upset about on Twitter. You can find out if they have grandchildren or children on Instagram. I mean, there's such a wealth that you can you can learn about somebody. And it doesn't necessarily be like, hi, Janine, hi, how can I help you? It's more, you know, is there an introduction you can make? I mean, I would love to see a show of hands. Uh, how many of us have connected people with uh, on LinkedIn? And then within 60 minutes, we have somebody trying to sell us something, right? How, yes, I'll raise my hand. Okay. I mean, <laughs> would it make a difference if somebody instead reached out to you and said, oh, you know, I noticed you had a new job at blah, blah, blah company. And I have a dear friend that used to work there and might be able to give you a whole bunch of information about the inner workings of that company, right? And that doesn't mean you had to go down and, you know, stalk the person to find out. I mean, this is publicly available information. So what I like to say is find the commonalities in the uncommonality when you reach out to somebody. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to go and already offer up your third child. But instead, really just figure out where there is some sort of bridge, and then you can have a dialogue that will help you ascertain what could be next. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for breaking that down for me. <laughs> um, okay, so you mentioned first asking, how can I help you, right? Um, like you were just saying, uh, not how can this person help me? Why is this approach so important, and how can we be more intentional about this? Well, this may sound, you know, completely Pollyanna-ish, but there's enough vitriol in the world. Uh, and, you know, putting a little bit of act of kindness out there never hurt anyone, okay? Also, again, to point out, my company has reaped so much benefits from leading with how can I be helpful? So I'm telling you this from, or I'm sharing this from grounded reality. Um, and I think it's the human way to go about living in the world. And if anything, this hell of a pandemic has taught us, we all could use a little bit of support now and then. And in some ways, it's created a world much more um, amenable to being open because we do have this shared vulnerability that I don't think many of us had before the pandemic. People are scared to be vulnerable. I know, but you know what? You know, you know, I'm looking at all the people on this on this wonderful um, webinar who are from all over the world. We all share something. We're dealing with a global pandemic, yeah. and we're dealing with global climate change. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> never before have this connected tissue um, bridge gaps across the world like ever before. I, I definitely agree with that, but. Yeah, vulnerability is scary. And I'm someone that struggles with that. So I can I can understand that. Um, we're going to talk about being a good listener, which you mentioned earlier and emphasized. Um, so what is the importance of being a good listener when it comes to relationship building? Um, and what's the best way to focus and become a better listener? I feel like I should listen to this. So I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'll catch you if you know. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting. I, uh, for the research in the book, I, I obviously went down various rabbit holes to learn about our, our woefully bad listening skills. Um, but there are solutions out there. And I was able to interview one of the world's renowned experts in better listening. His name is Dr. Julian Treasure. He's done four or five TED Talks all on how to listen better. So I am by no means an expert on it. I was able to interview him. So I would very much suggest folks listen to one or all of his TED Talks and really listen. But one of the things he is a huge advocate of is learning to lessen our anticipatory listening, meaning when we listen to others, always thinking about how we're going to respond, what are we going to do next, and instead just try to absorb. Secondly, you know, as our world has been increasingly noisy, whether we're in online meetings or eventually in, in, in real life meetings, I take notes when I'm talking, even in a room sometimes, just so I don't forget. 
so that then not only am I paying attention to what the person's saying because I'm writing it down, but I have found that to be really helpful. And lastly, Janine, you asked me the important question of why is this important? And if you think about the gather, ask, do that I described, if you want to go from the ask to the do, if you don't listen, you're never going to get there, right? I mean, if you don't listen to others, how are you ever going to be supportive or make connections or follow through? So to me, that's right there. Bingo. I was listening. I, <laughs> I feel like I, I, sound, I sound like Fraser Crane, right? I am listening. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was listening. Um, I, I, and I wonder, because I'm someone that really struggles with that. Like when I'm listening, you know, when I am listening to someone talk to me, it's like, I am trying to formulate like my response, right? As I'm listening to them. Um, how, like, how can you, I don't know, how, like, can, can you take a step back, right? Like, how can you keep your mind from just kind of like formulating what you're going to say and just totally listen? Like, how can you do that? And I'm asking generally because sure. I don't know. Well, that is why I write down. It forces me to listen. The other thing that I've gotten much bolder about as I've gotten um, advanced in years, and that is, when I find myself going to that, oh, what, what Thai food am I going to order tonight? Or, you know, there's dishes in my sink. I grab myself and I bring myself back. And I've learned it's okay to say to the person you're talking to, wait, I missed what you said. Can you repeat it? Right? I think for years, I'd be afraid to admit I was zoning off. Okay. But I think we all, again, you know, we can give each other's permission to zone off, right? But zone out. But if we can catch ourselves and be honest and upfront, then we're being better communicators. So try to catch yourself and, and be, you know, we're human. It's going to happen. I yeah. am thinking while I'm talking to you, doing, you know, speaking to 500 to 1,000 people about the dishes in my sink because I can see them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I can't see mine, but I know that I have to do them uh, later <laughs> on today. Um, <laughs> You just mentioned we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Unfortunately, we're still there. Um, and we're meeting online and so many different meetings um, and events have been online. Um, and people are struggling to connect virtually, um, you know, while we're still separated from everyone, right? Um, how can we create meaningful relationships right now? Uh, is there a way to do it virtually and, you know, in person? Like, what can we do to continue uh, to uh, flourish, you know, the relationships that we have. Well, clearly meetup is doing it. Okay. I mean, the fact that you have been continuing this engine through this global pandemic is remarkable and enviable. Um, cause I don't, th I don't know of any other global organizations that have been able to do this. Um, I also want to be very mindful and conscious of the fact that there are people here today from all over the world that are varying stages of the ability to go out, the ability, um, as well as just the hardship of all of this. Um, you know, for me, um, you know, I, I was, I stayed healthy. I had other issues like back surgery and crap like that, that I won't bore everybody with. But I will tell you, for me, I am, as you can tell, I'm, I'm kind of an extrovert. And I used to travel all the time so that I didn't get lonely because I live in a home. I am single, I don't have parents and I don't have children. Um, so traveling was a way to kind of fill that kind of void. And all of a sudden, obviously everything stopped and I couldn't. So for me, every single day, and I still continue to do this, I would reach out to three to five people in whatever mode struck my fancy. So if I was out walking my dog, I might text, I might Pick, I might call, I might WhatsApp, I might email, but I would just reach out and say what my parents used to say, thinking about you, sending love. Is there something you could need, right? Or you, you need right now? And that was it. And I would do it every day. And there were three reasons why I did that. One, to put a little joy in the world. Two, to connect with folks. And three, to be like, hey, don't forget me. I'm here in Brooklyn. And that was my way of staying connected. And, you know, people are like, well, how did you think of the three people? And I say, always say to people, how many times have you been driving in your car or walking down the street or, or biking? And biking probably isn't a good idea. But a name comes across your brain and you say, oh, I'll get to it. And I should also say, if you're driving, don't do this either. But you can voice <laughs> memo. 
And you can just remind yourself so that when you get home or when you get off that Zoom chat or that Microsoft Teams meeting, you can then follow through. And sometimes it's, there's no agenda. So I would think, you know, all of us, it's very easy to put things off when it's just as easy to be able to like say, Janine, you popped in my brain. I just wanted to send a little love today. And that's it. But just something like that is healthy for you and for the recipient. Something so simple and so small. Um, I feel like we all have homework for tomorrow morning now. Um, so Susan, you will be one of the three people. I will reach out to you and let you know <laughs> that I reached out to two other people and I'm thinking of you. Um. <laughs> I just ask you, when you get those types of, uh, those, those notes, it feels good, right? I think, you know, I think for me, it's twofold, right? Like it feels good to receive, to know that, you know, my friends are thinking of me in the midst of everything that's happening. But I think for me, it kind of makes me feel guilty. Like I need to be a better friend, right? And be better about communicating um, with, with my friends. But that's, but, but that's not to say like, that's just, I feel like I'm just a really bad communicator with my friends, right? Like I'm not very good at staying in touch with people. So it's like, that just kind of reminds me that, you know, okay, I know that I have this problem. I need to get better. I need to get better. I need to get better. I would also reposition. I don't think it's a problem. Oh, okay. I think it's something that it, it just is what it is. And, you know, if it, 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 if it suits you, obviously I'm not suggesting, but professionally, it could be really beneficial. And also personally, if you just don't, you know, if you don't make a big deal out of it, right. That's, that's, I guess the way I'm trying to describe it. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, I should make less of a big deal about it and just, you know, be happy that someone thought of me and just uh, reciprocate that and reach out to someone else. Um, so you mentioned that you're an extrovert, uh, as am I. Um, so what happens if you're not an extrovert, right? What if you're shy or, or you're an introvert? Um, how would you go about creating, uh, you know, these types of meaningful relationships? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, the word begins with a capital B, boundaries. And I also want to say I named this book The Lost Art of Connecting, not The Lost Art of Networking, because I see connecting and networking to be two very, very different things. I'm not anti-networking, but if you look up the definition of networking in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it's pretty god-awful. It's very transactional. It's all about what can I get rather than what can I give. And it's one to many. And there's a reason work is in networking. So first of all, for people who may be shy or introverted, this is about one-to-one, -one, which again, I'm not an introvert, so I don't wanna put thoughts in other people's minds, but one-to-one -one is a little more feasible for someone who might be have social anxiety or, or shy. Two, we again, have all this technology so that we can pre-game when we go to events, whether they're virtual or in person. In many cases, we can find out a good majority of the people who are gonna be in the room so that we can be intentional about who is it that we wanna connect with, what five people, you know, as opposed to 500, and, and find out why with a game plan. And one of my, my um, favorite items from the book is go with the triumvirate or power of three before any event, and that is, Pick three people you want to meet. Be prepared to share three things about you, meaning being a little bit vulnerable, and then learn three things about those people. And then you can go hide in the bathroom. But in other words, these are things, this is a way to kind of like, dare I say, master an event so that you walk away and feel refreshed and not horrific, but also you know, you shared a bit about yourself too, but not to 50 or 100 people, to three people. Heck, if three's too much, try two. <laughs> so what are, I, I, can you give an example of what are three things that someone should share? Like, what's the barometer, right? Like, are you going to share something about your hobby, something that you enjoy, work? Like, what, you know? I think the sky is the limit. I think obviously, you know, much depends on what the event's about and what your goals are. And if you go back to the gather part of the gather as do, you're, you know, and I don't want to be so prescriptive, but, you know, obviously current events, but to me in the book, I have um, a chapter that has 11 questions that you can have in your back pocket. And they're not about the weather in Cleveland or, you know, Oshkosh, it's, or New Zealand. Um, they're questions uh, along the lines that are going to help others open up, but you can't expect others to open up if you're not going to also. So, you know, an obvious question right now is how are you doing during this pandemic? And are there some ways 
I in the world that I live in could be supportive or helpful. Two, when this pandemic is over, where in the world do you want to fly to or drive to or get on a train to and why? Because that's going to tell you, you know, uh, uh, something. So, so those are two examples of ways to have a more meaningful conversation rather than, you know, asking them what they had for lunch that day. I will also say, you know, both, you know, when we go into, I mean, oftentimes we've been in meetings this, this last year online where we break into to rooms. And sometimes, as everyone noticed, there's that like, all of a sudden nobody knows what to say. And almost always we go to the weather. Like it's like a, it's just a, it, it's just like a nervous tick because it's, it's, it's harmless, right? But it also doesn't get anything interesting talking. So to me, come prepared and have a few questions you wanna ask of others. Thank you, thank you. That's, that's excellent, Ex excuse me, excellent. Um, yeah, I always, you know, I consider myself to be someone that can pretty much have a conversation with anyone. Um, and I, I don't know if it's the case. I mean, yes, I prepare, you know, depending on who it is, just like you said, right? Like, you know, who you want to talk to and be prepared to talk to them. But if it's a random conversation, I, I feel like I can just talk to anyone. And I guess like I had really great practice at this when I was a waitress, um, because, you know, you need to be able to connect with the guests and that's pretty much how you know, you're going to connect with them, right? Like you just find, like you said, commonality, right? Just ask them a question and then you kind of share something and it just goes back and forth, right? Like that connection just develops. Yep. Well, and Janine, I was a waitress in college and my God, over the years when there've been fear points in my life where I thought I was going to lose a job in the back of my mind, I was like, I can always go back and wait tables. <laughs> a ton I it was like it was it was like a cash cow because, yeah yeah I mean you know it was the hardest work I've ever done but I always say waiting on tables and being a researcher at an at an at a news company both of those really seeded my career because it helped me live that curious you know be curious and there's no greater gift for all of us than to live a life being curious. I mean, there's obviously lots of other gifts, but for me, that that is a great way to move through the world. It is. It is. I, I agree. Um, you need that curiosity, right? I mean, I in my that's how you evolve. That's how you grow, and that's how you learn. Um, okay, so Susan. Um, hoping, being very hopeful here, uh, you know, we are starting to reconnect in person and we're going to continue uh, to, you know, reconnecting um, in person. Uh, what are some tips, um, you know, to make that reverse transaction successful? Sure. Well, first and foremost, be gentle with yourself. I feel like at least in, in the geography I live in, New York City, there was a, like a false start, right? In May, everybody was like, oh, we're going back. And I had some friends that like would go to these massive populated events. And then I had other friends that were like, again, hiding under their couch because of like, wait, I've been out of practice for a year and a half. So first of all, give yourself a break. Don't make you know unbelievable expectations on yourself because you know, what we have been through and what we in many cases are still going through, the, it's going to be years before we know what kind of psychological effect it has had on us. So just, you know, give yourself grace Two, start small um, and, you know, and meet somebody for coffee or a walk or lunch. But I, unless you are gung ho, I would, you know, limit. But again, everybody's, everybody's um, barometer is, is different. But again, and I sound like a, a broken, whatever, rec broken record. <laughs> There's not records anymore. Um, do your research beforehand, you know, who's going to be in the room or who, you know, who are a few people that you want to meet if it's a, it's a room full of 20 so that you're not running around and just shaking hands with, with all sorts of people. I mean, that's fine. If you do that, I'm not, I'm not dissuading that, but if you want to walk away and feel like you fulfilled or you kind of, you know, made some tremendously good new, new connections, that's how I would advise. Um, and, and again, you know, the, the technology we are blessed with having, we didn't have 20 years ago. Oh, I know. I always wonder, how did we get around 20 years ago, especially with like now having GPS? And do you remember like MapQuest? No, I remember <laughs> in California driving using a Thomas guide, which was this huge Bible. And I swear with, you know, and I had a stick shift. I can't imagine how I didn't like kill people on, 
you know, California's 405 freeway. Cause there I was, you know, like trying to figure out what the exit was, stick shift, coffee. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't, it's, I don't get it either. Um, I, I have no idea. Um, so I, I have two questions. Um, one, you mentioned missing out for a year and a half, right? So in your book, you write about FOMO and JOMO. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Okay. Can you explain the two? And then my next question, this is, again, I'm just like asking you my own personal questions. Um, so I know that you talk about a lot, a lot about preparation, right? If you're going somewhere and you know who's going to be there, what if you, what happens if you go to an event and you don't know who's going to be there, right? Like, is there anything else that you can do to prepare? Like you mentioned the questions that you should have in your back pocket. Like, is there anything that you have to do differently or just treat it the same? I would, well, first of all, one of the things that's always grounded me when I walk into a room of I don't know anyone and I see someone standing by themselves, you know, your first inkling is, oh, that person wants to be by themselves. And you know what? Sometimes they do, but chances are that person is just as nervous and uptight as you are walking into a room not knowing anyone. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with walking up and saying hello. I know it's scary. It's like, oh my God, who is this person? But just remember, almost always that person is going to think, oh, I am so relieved. I'm not standing here by myself anymore. Okay. And that has helped ground me over the years. And, you know, just a side note, I am tiny. I know on the Zoom, I seem <laughs> tall, but in real life, my license says I'm five foot. So I'll let you guess. Oh my gosh. So am I. I add, I add the 0.5 just to make it seem cooler. Oh yeah. Especially on dating sites, right? <laughs> you know, I wear my hair Right. On. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when I would walk in a room, no one would see me. So in other words, I had to kind of call attention or do something. And that actually is partly why I've learned to ask so many questions of others, because people are much, again, gross generalization, but people are much more comfortable talking about themselves than they are about other things. So if I would come and ask questions, not in a, you know, maniacal or, or, or insulting way, but just, you know, curiosity questions, you know, uh, where is your favorite place to, you know, go to dinner here in New York City. You know, something like that, that just it, it very nuanced, but but keep it, it it's gonna tell you something more about the person than again, you know, did they, where, where did they go that day or something? I don't know, I'm babbling. And now of course I forgot the question you asked first. Jomo <laughs> and Jomo. Oh, oh, Jomo. Um, in the early nineties, I ran a sales territory uh, when I was driving and almost hurting people, um, not, not. <laughs> Um, and I was working for a company called PR Newswire, and, which is a newswire service. And in that particular area of Southern California, no one knew that company and they only knew our competitor. So I was smiling and dialing. Yes, it was, I think maybe at that point it was a push button phone to try to get meetings. And I couldn't get any because people were like, who are you? What company? Never heard of you. And I finally, you know, added three people that I knew. I brought every, the three people I knew together for coffee. And we all worked in the public relations field. And we had such a lovely time, this was 1992. And we decided from there, we were gonna meet every other week and each of us would bring two other people. Within six months, we had about 140 people attending. And it became the event for anyone in that community that worked in public relations in Orange County. Wow. So, okay. And so in other words, my fear of missing out turned into the joy of meeting others. And I learned a lot from that. Number one, you as the host don't have to do all the inviting. Two, you know, I get I get FOMO now, uh, like all, you know, I did in high school when I would come back on Mondays and, and hear about all the parties I didn't get invited to. And I, of course, do now when I see all the, you know, the virtual gatherings on Instagram. But instead, I have realized that if I can create an event, and again, knowing I don't have to do all the heavy lifting, but ask people to bring others, then what I have turned my fear into something joyful. And it has helped me connect with people that I never would have ever known. So it's a win-win. And have one of the most popular events. Yeah, I, I, I'll i say. Um, can I share my question? <laughs> so I have a question, Susan, that I ask, like if I, see, if I don't know anyone at an event, which there's, I mean, I go to places by myself all the time. Um, so if there's an event that I go to and I don't know anyone there and I see someone else that's alone, my go-to question is, how do you know the host or, you know, whatever the name, like I if you're that. the host, it's like, how do you know Susan? Yeah. So that's not a lame question. That's like not a good question. All. Not at all. And 
you know, over the years, I have hosted so many gatherings. And one of the things I always do is make sure when I introduce two people is letting them both know how, so I'm doing the reverse. So I think that's a beautiful question and good for you. Thank you. Yeah. I always feel like such like that, just, you know, after that, like when you ask that question, like usually a really great story is going to be the response of how they know this person. So yeah, that's my question. Um, okay. So I have two more questions before we take questions from the audience. Um, so what is something that, uh, you want people to take away um, from your book? Yeah. Well, one of my favorite items, which I think is, is certainly a, a uplifting piece of advice that I learned uh, is the fact that making meaningfully connecting with others a priority in your life will actually lengthen your life. You will live a healthier and longer life. I mean, barring all the other things, um, even more so than eating kale every day and running. Now, I will say... <sighs> <laughs> thank thank you kale's right here. i'm like wait i'm just like why am i eating all this kale and running like <laughs> and thank i can't you. You i don't have to eat kale anymore sorry go on <laughs> but if you've ever needed an excuse that is one i got it okay thank you for that <laughs> okay so susan um as you know, we have a lot of meetup organizers that are listening in here. Um, what advice would you have for organizers attending uh, events, you know, and what they should do during their events to build connections and help others, uh, you know, connect with each other? Well, knowing that we're still in a, a virtual world, I think, you know, I mean, in some ways we are so blessed by Zoom and by the chat in Zoom or the chat in the other different platforms that I think wherever and ever, and at any time you can be showcasing the good that other people are doing and shouting people out with compliments as opposed to criticizing is your best friend. And I think as a host, it's your responsibility to do that. And also do um, exactly what Janine and I were just talking about is create commonalities among the uncommonalities. And you as the host should know at least a certain subset of the people attending. And go out of your way to help people feel safe. Because we can't assume that every single person on these very Zooms feels safe. You know, it, 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 it's wrong. And, and, you know, I say this, I do a lot of talks with companies. And I think one of the things we've learned from this pandemic is, is well, not one of the things, we've learned tons of things, but connecting in the workplace, connecting with people professionally actually makes you much more likely to stay at the company, be more productive, and more likely to recommend the company to others. So if you're a business leader, if you're running an organization, if you're hosting a meetup, you're gonna have many more returns if you make it a priority to connect people and help them feel comfortable and be vulnerable yourself. That was a long answer. I apologize. But that was a great answer. I, I think, I mean, I feel like, you know, it just, it goes back to all these things, right? Like kindness right when you're being kind and you're and you know you're giving to others also vulnerable right you talk about vulnerability which which these are all you know really really important things um for us to build connections um meaning you know not just a connection but a meaningful connection um you know one thing my parents taught me that i am so grateful for and that is this notion that every single person no matter who they are where they're from their cultural background is worthy of our curiosity, our consideration, and our compassion. So we tend to, and I've done this in my life, so I, I'm certainly, you know, guilty as charged, is make assumptions, right? We assume because somebody has a particular job or role at a company or an organization or, you know, what have you, that that person can't be helpful to us or vice versa. And I like to believe that every single one of us is worthwhile of our of our interest and our attention and our care and that is how that, that is just I, it's a better way to live because we're all we're all we all have more in common than we do not in common yeah we're all humans <laughs> we're all we're all humans and just trying to get by um okay susan thank you so so much for answering all of those questions um i have a ton of questions that the audience has submitted. So I am going to ask away. But actually, before I do that, um, I'm just going to do a plug for Susan's book. Um, and I'll do one again later. Um, please, 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 
pick up her book so that you can learn more about her method, gather, ask, and do. Did I get that right? Yes, but that's not the name of the book. <laughs> I know it's not the name of the book. No, no, no. So you can learn more about it. But the name of the book is The Lost Art of Connecting. Um, so please pick up the book. We're sharing a link on the chat. Um, if you're interested in purchasing the book, just click on that link and it will take you to the site. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask, the first question is from Martina. Um, Martina asked, but if I'm too good a listener and my problem comes from this, that people are always telling me their needs and they ignore that I have my own needs or stories to tell. People are so selfish. They want to talk about themselves all the time. Well, my advice there is you don't have to get it all within that first interaction, right? My late father was a professor and he always said, leave people wanting more, meaning it's an, it's an ongoing, like these relationships are not just that first five minutes. I mean, they can be if you don't wanna pursue it, but if you're engaging with somebody and they're only talking about themselves, you have you know, a couple of options. You, either, you can listen to them, obviously. Um, you can interject and say, oh, very interesting. Did you know that I, in other words, bridge and then make a comment, or you could graciously extricate yourself and move on to somebody who may be more engaging and may be into that reciprocity that I think is vitally important for connection. making. Thank you. Um, okay, so Jamie. Uh, this is this one is like so important. Um, asked, I struggle with social anxiety. What are what are the steps that I do to overcome the fear of socializing? Huge question, Jamie. And believe it or not, there have been so many events that I have wanted to go hide in the bathroom. And I have. And I've actually met people in the bathroom because I was hiding. Um, but I think this goes back to pre-gaming. Any, any time you, you go to, to an event, a conference, before you're getting on a Zoom chat. And, and realize what your own, um, what you can do being filled with anxiety and really focus on one or two people that you want to meet as opposed to, you know, thinking of it as like 25 people in a room. And then, you know, have a few questions in your back pocket so that you can ask and then just listen. So you don't have to do all the talking. I mean, that's why in some ways this gather, ask, do approach can be very comforting to people who don't want to be doing all the talking. Because if you're asking the questions, guess what? you get to listen twice as much as you're speaking. Two ears, one mouth. I love that. Again, I'm, I'm learning to listen. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions about Julian Treasure. Did I say, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did I say the name correctly? Dr. Julian Treasure, his, his TED Talks are all available free to watch, download, to share. Highly recommended. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll be sure to include that in the blog recap as well. Uh, we'll share a link there. Um, okay, more questions. Um, Yeti, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, uh, he or she's name correctly, um, asks, can you please elaborate a bit more on do? You mentioned take all, all you listen to and take that forward. Well, again, it's going to depend on in what circumstances you're meeting somebody, you know, whether it's online or, you know, at an event, at a luncheon, you know, hopefully if we get back into conferences and conventions at some point. But to me, do is, is, is metaphorical for, you know, being a good follow upper, if I can go so far as, as, as um, identify it as that. But, you know, when you are talking to somebody and if they share something that they are desiring, that you follow up and you reiterate what you heard, meaning you basically write back to them and say, Janine, I heard you wanna become a better listener. So here are some tips that you can do to, to be able to overcome your lack of listening skills or blah, 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 blah. And by doing that, one, you show that you actually listen to the person. And two, you had that point of commonality that you, you both discussed, right? You, you were talking about something that was of interest. And then you follow through. And then three weeks later, you follow through again, right? This is not a one and done kind of thing. This is, these are relationships you're gonna build over time. And some people are gonna ebb and flow, right? They're gonna come into your life and they're gonna come out of your life. But the ones that are needing to be meaningful to you and vice versa are the ones that are going to remain. So to me, it's being responsive. I mean, you don't have to write back as soon as you leave the event or you know the evening after the event, but we all know what happens when we put things off. 
So I sometimes try, or I often do try to follow up while it's still fresh in mind, but I'm also a slave to the notepad. And I write down, you know, the three people that I met with and, you know, maybe their email addresses or something, or I, I voice memo it to myself so that I don't forget. So much of what you just said sounds like intentionality. Yes. You yeah. have to be intentional. Yeah. But the thing is, in, as you do this over time, you become trustworthy. You become reliable. You become a person who's known as someone who gets the proverbial SHIT done. And I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. So I... you can say the word. <laughs> <laughs> of course you can swear. I mean, if that was the case, then I probably would not be asked to host this. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, okay, we have some more questions. Uh, oh, I just found one. I just lost it. Goodness. Okay. Paula asked, how can we move from these curious conversations and into friendships? Is there some ways to invite people to further contact after the event? Looking for some tips that can make this non-awkward. You mean, I, I'm not sure I quite understand. You, mean you go to an event and then you follow up? Yeah, so I guess she's asking, you know, she meets someone, you know, you go to an event, you meet someone, and she's looking for it to develop into a friendship and not just, oh, I just met you here. You know, how are you? I guess kind of like, I How think, can, yeah, I'm, I'm a, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I'm a believer in being direct and being intentional. And that way people have the option of whether to engage or not. Um, you know, we're all too busy with, you know, oh, it was nice meeting you. Bye. But instead say, it was great meeting you. I would love to schedule a five minute chat on blah, 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 or blah, 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 blah. Because I'd love to learn more about what your role is at X, Y, Z. So I can maybe be helpful. In other words, not, I want to meet with you so that I can pick your brain or you can help me, but how can I be helpful to you? Perfect. I like that. Um, so, okay, we have a lot more questions, but I think I'm going to ask my last two questions. Danielle asked, how can a new meetup post make connections that last during COVID when people have different comfort levels while gathering? Well, I'm a big believer now and I, I, all signs are going to show that we're going to be in a hybrid situation where people who are feeling safer or are feeling more secure and geographically available will be able to go to an event, but there will be an online version as well. Thank you. I, I don't, you know, and I actually love having the option because there are times where I'm like, yeah, I want to go and, you know, meet people in person. And there's times where I'm like, that just sounds like a very big undertaking, especially after you've had like a really long day, but I still want to meet these people. I just don't want, you know, to have like the travel commitment. That's a part of it. You know what I mean? So it's like having that option. I just, I, for me, it has been super helpful. I love that I get to join meetup events um, online. Sure. And one thing, and you might've, you know, years ago advised this, but I always take a photo of the room that I'm in, the, the, the online room. Because then I have everybody's names, or at least the ones that have their, their names visible, and you can follow up with them or connect with them on other social channels. Something that uh, someone did at an event that I attended is, um, I, this is like usual practice for them. So they always ask, like if they have like a special speaker or someone like, you know, different people interchange or interact, sorry. And they always send out a questionnaire asking if there was anyone that you wanted to connect with Love from that. there. And then they just, you know, you give your email and they connect you, which is so easy, right? Because it takes away from you having to like reach out to them, right? And, and that, you know, being, uh, having that fear that they're not going to respond or, or rejection, right? But it's like, it's made so easy. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. I mean, I thought it was just such a great, you know, way to get people to connect without that pressure. Um, so I have one last question. Kim asked, how do I, as an organizer of online groups, help set boundaries for people with responses when I ask questions? How do you set boundaries for people? I'm not sure. When, when they ask questions, I guess, you know, she's, she's asking folks questions and she wants to make sure that the, question, the responses are thoughtful and mindful and respectful. Well, you're never going to be able to force people to do anything, but I think it's, it's, it's an important reminder at the beginning of the event, throughout the event, 
in the email that goes out before the event, in the email follow-up. I think any chance you have to be very explicit about how people are going to be engaging is it, 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 worthwhile and worth the effort. Thank you, Susan. And that's it for all the questions. I'm going to share my screen again, if I can get my mouse to work. Awesome. Uh -oh. thank you. This was wonderful. And thank you to everyone who attended. It's been such a joy. And I hope to meet everybody. Please feel free to share anything. About so for whatever reason, I my screen isn't working. I think like something froze on my end. So I can't share my screen. I'm so sorry. I can't share my screen. It's frozen on my end and it's not allowing me to share. Okay, well, here's what I'm gonna say. For everyone that tuned in today, thank you again so much, Susan, for joining us today. Um, I ask you know, that you go ahead and pick up Susan's book, The Lost Art of Connecting. We're sharing a link uh, on the chat. It will take you directly to the site and you can purchase the book. It is a wonderful book and it has so many great nuggets uh, for you meeting people and you know building those relationships, whether it's business or professional. Again, Susan, ooh, it's okay. Thank you so much for joining. Uh oh, I hope I didn't scare the dog. Um, have a great day, everyone. And if you join too late, don't worry. You can uh, access a recording and a recap of this event on our blog at meetup.com slash blog. Have a great day, y'all.